Yeah, sometimes you just got to accept reality and that sometimes you inevitably get hit by copyright strikes, well, copyright claims that uh, end up blocking your videos worldwide. Sometimes you just have to accept that. But those who know me very well will know that I'm not someone that goes down very easily. And this week was no different. I mentioned in my Rocket League stream, well, I mentioned in my Rocket League videos that When I got hit by a copyright claim on one of my Tom and Jerry, one of my Everything Wrong With Tom and Jerry videos, I ended up being hit by a copyright claim that blocked the video worldwide. So, I took, a, I took it upon myself to make a couple of tweaks to the video. And I re-uploaded the video on Monday we are now on Friday and I've had no claims so at the end of the day you can you can put me down but you can't keep me down because to take a page out of the almighty King Ezekiel's playbook Kenzie Retro will not fall not on this day like I said, you can you can kick me down, but you can't keep me down. I am here to stay. I ain't going anywhere any time soon. My fellow Mormons will understand this next reference. You could say I'm a stripling warrior. Because no matter how many times I get kicked down, I always get back up. I always get back up, and I am here to stay. Hello, my fellow Latter-day Saints. Kenzie Retro, the Mormon Entertainer here, the most inspirational Mormon in all of Asia. Back once again. It's Friday, and that means only one thing, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Roll the intro, maestro! If you're looking for a place to go and find some trophies This is the place to be in the charge of no fees If you're on Xbox and need some game to score Come over here, I'll help you get some more My name is Kenzie Retro, the host of the show Give me news and reviews and all you need to know Because the weekend is finally here at last Sit back, relax, enjoy the Trophy Achievement Podcast That's right, it's another edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast, your one-stop shop for all the latest gaming news, gaming rumours, and of course, those sweet points and trophies at the end of the show. So, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to get some background music. I just need to... There we go, there we go. Hang on a second. Right, I just need to make sure it doesn't drown out the um yeah, that'll do. Right. Also just just doing a couple of tests. Anyway. Here we go. Uh, so we've got a lot of news to get through uh, this week. Um, and of course, there's going to be, I'm going to have uh, a reaction to uh, the Red Dead Redemption 2 gameplay trailer that got unveiled just yesterday. There we go. Official 
gameplay reveal trailer. Here we go. So, we'll get that shortly. We've got news on Fallout, we've got news on Halo, news on Ubisoft, Fortnite, uh, news on Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. I reported on a, I reported on rumors of a, a new Def Jam game coming up, and we've got more. We've got more. We've got uh, we've got something on that as well. Uh, news on Microsoft and PUBG, and news on Sony. And in the points and trophies section, in order of we happy few coming out today, I am going to go through the entire achievement list for we. Happy few. Yep. All 40 achievements with the famous 1000 Gamer Score! So, <clears throat> with that in mind, I am going to get right into news, but before that, just get something out very quickly. Uh, well, I'm due another couple of rentals through, I'm due another couple of rentals later in the next few days, and I got this one through as a bonus. Now, what you're probably thinking to yourself is, how do you get a bonus game from Boomerang Rentals? Well, that's where the payback system comes into play. The the points you earn, you can earn points based on the amount of, based on whether you make purchases on the website or through waiting, a certain, um, or through waiting, or through waiting for your next rental to come through, be it through, be it a few days or maybe a, a week or two. And from there, what you can do is you can use those payback points to redeem, and you can redeem them for a bonus rental, which you can have for two weeks before it goes on to your currently renting um, section on the website. <clears throat> a big shout out, as always, by the way, to Boomerang Rentals there. Uh, Packages start from as little as $3.99 a month. Sign up today, get a 21 day free trial, and you get three free game rentals. Once you start renting, you're gonna start saving. You can play the latest games for as little as $9.99 a month. And my word, like I said, once you start renting, you're gonna start saving. BoomerangRentals.co.uk, the best place to rent your games. Let's all laugh at an industry that never learns anything, tee hee hee. And of course that jingle means only one thing, ladies and gentlemen. We have got a gaming screw up of the week. So, what, so who could possibly be in this gaming screw up of the week? Well, we're gonna find out, uh, pretty shortly. So, yeah, so, but before that, uh, into the, um, my account, there we go. There we go. Saved approximately £1,316 since joining. Now, onto the gaming screw-up, and this gaming screw-up, oh, it's a Oh my goodness me, it is a very, very, very juicy one. So, 
This article was published um, last week, in fact. So here we go. So here we go. The upcoming Spyro Reignited Trilogy will require a significant download of some sort for Spyro 2's Ripto Rage, Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage and Spyro Year of the Dragon. The game's official website points out two out of the three games on retail on the retail disc. Spyro 2 Ripto's Rage and Spyro Year of the Dragon will require download. Ren reached for comment about what that specifically means. Activision provided IGN with the following statement at first giving at first as first given to PlayStation Lifestyle. As with most games today, downloading an update after purchase is quite common. The language on packaging and on the web is to let the players know the requirements for Spiral Reignited Trilogy. However, even after Activision's comments, it's unclear exactly what these downloads will require. While some have taken the meaning to be the full second and third game will need to be downloaded, it remains unclear if the Activision means major chunks of all the full games need to be downloaded, or this instead, or this is instead in reference to a day one patch, the size and necessity of which has yet to be determined. The patch may contain whatever changes developer Toys for Bob would need to make for Spyro 2 and 3 right up to the trilogy's launch, or something more significant. Spiral Reignited Trilogy will re be released on September 21st for PlayStation 4 and Xbox One. Now, there's a video that actually talks about this. And I'm just going to play it in the background, and we'll take it from there. Now, here's another thing that's very upsetting to folks of us who are excited about Spyro the Reignited Trilogy, which looks pretty fantastic. Oh. <laughs> Don't do that to me, OBS. Anyway, where were we? Um of us who were getting investigated by IGN said so just don't now here's another thing that's very upsetting to folks of us who were excited about Spyro the reignited trilogy mm -hmm. which looks pretty fantastic um, especially because they're building it kind of from the ground up the way that they did uh, Crash Bandicoot mm -hmm. but uh, the folks over at Activision always ready to disappoint have decided to disappoint by including only one of the three games on the actual physical disc the other literally what I so, so there we go. This is part of the screw up. This is just part of it. This is just the tip of the iceberg, ladies and gentlemen. So, to quote Stewie from Family Guy, good day to you, Activision. And now prepare to die! Other two games you're going to have to download uh, digitally if you want to play them, and that's even if you buy the physical disc. You need to download the Spirals 2 and 3 if you get the physical copy. You need to download Spirals 2 and Year of the Dragon to play them if you get the physical copy. Release. Now, for those of you who are saying, I buy all my games digitally, I understand, I do as well, so this is probably not going to affect me, but a lot of people who are into retro games and retro remakes who are going to purchase this are the kind of people who would like to buy the physical media so that they can play that again eventually. And here's the thing, they're not going to be able to do that without internet access, they're not going to be able to do it without digitally downloading it, they're not going to be able to do it once the servers are gone, this remake will be lost to internet history because there will be no physical copy of number two and number three. And Servers? For these two? 
service for Ripto's Revenge and Year of the Dragon. This is going to be interesting. And that kind of stinks. Now, to be fair to Activision, I can think of a few legitimate reasons you may need to do this. SINCE WHEN HAVE ACTIVISION DONE ANYTHING LEGITIMATE BESIDES THE CRASH BANDICOOT TRILOGY?! That's what I thought. Uh, the first of which is, maybe there's just not enough room on the disc for all three games. NOT ENOUGH ROOM! IT'S A BLU-RAY DISC WHICH HAS FOUR TIMES THE STORAGE OF A STANDARD DVD DISC! Though that seems very unlikely considering the games that we're talking about here. Um, secondly, it could just be that they had worked on and finished the first game by the time they were ready to go gold with the disc. The additional two games, they are not even close to finishing yet, and they're going to need literally every day to get the game done. So that bodes very, very well for the quality of the second and third game, if that's the case. Bodes well. Ha! <laughs> I don't think so. What they could have done was simply... Waited until... What they could have done was simply do two and three, delayed the release of the trilogy. What's wrong with delaying the release trilogy? Oh, what's wrong? What's wrong with delaying the release date? Oh yeah, it's Activision. They only care about demonies and Call of Duty. Regardless, the folks who were designing this game uh, did make a statement. Uh, even though it's very much a non-statement, they basically said, "We know people are excited. We're sorry that this is happening." Um, but it is <laughs> Sorry this is happening. You've only got yourselves to blame, Activision! Happening, and it's not the first time it's happened in the industry. Other people have... <sighs> not the first time this has happened. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, because, like, EA and Konami haven't done stuff like this before. Got it, too. Uh, they didn't really give a reason. But I guess if you want to buy Spyro, just know you're going to have to download the second and third game. You're only going to get one game on disc. If that's important to you, you should know. DETAILS, ACTIVISION! THEY ARE IMPORTANT! Now, for those of ye who thought it... <sighs> You've screwed up, Spyro! And it's not even out yet! You tell us this... SIX WEEKS! BEFORE THE GAME IS DUE TO COME OUT! You tell us this SIX WEEKS BEFORE THE GAME COMES OUT! Six weeks. You tell us this now? Just weeks before the game is due to come out? Now, I read some comments regarding this whole debacle. And one of them pretty much got it down to a T, saying that I wouldn't be too surprised if they ended up releasing 2 and 3 physically. And if they do that, I ask this. Why did you not delay the game to begin with? Why did you not delay the release? Because this is not the first time you've done something like this, Activision. You bundle Infinite Warfare with Special Edition. You bundle Special Editions with, of Infinite Warfare with the Modern Warfare Remaster with no option of buying it with the Standard Edition. And then... To rub the salt in and get more money out of us, you decide to release Modern Warfare Remastered standalone anyway. And then you skip over Modern Warfare 2, 
which has been far more requested for backwards compatibility than Modern Warfare 3 ever will be, and yet you put Modern Warfare 3 backwards compatible. And then you have the original version of Modern Warfare backwards compatible not too long after the remaster, therefore making the remaster completely pointless! This is not the first time Activision have screwed up, ladies and gentlemen. And I guarantee it won't be the last. So, I urge you guys, if you've pre-ordered, if you've pre-ordered a physical copy of Spyro, cancel that pre-order, boycott the remaster, and tell Activision how you feel. Because I'm telling them how I feel right here, Right now, you messed up Activision, own up to your mistakes, and delay the release of the game until you get Spiral 2 and 3 at a physical release state. The fact that you, the fact that you need to download, the fact that only the first game is going to be available on the disc, The fact that it's going to be just the first game on the disc, and you've got to download Spyro 2 and Year of the Dragon separately. And I don't normally deviate from my family friendly values, but can you blame me? Activision, you've got done! For future reference, folks, when it comes to remasters, never trust Activision. Never trust Activision, never trust EA, never trust Konami. Well, right, it never trust Ubisoft either, because you might as well class you might as well class all four of them as the Four Horsemen of the Gaming Apocalypse. EA and Activision, I've already explained. Konami, because of the way they've treated their employees, in particular Hideo Kojima prior to him being released. And then, Ubisoft, for not understanding the word difficulty. Never have and never will, as far as I'm concerned. And while I'm on the subject of Ubisoft, let's get the music on in the background now. So here we go. <clears throat> Ubisoft quietly cancels Switch game Steep and decides not to tell anybody. Congratulations Ubisoft, you messed up as well. Ubisoft has cancelled the Nintendo Switch version of the snowboarding and skiing extreme sports game Steep. Cancelling... The cancelling came... The cancellation came quietly via a message to a fan on Twitter. Explaining the cancellation, Ubisoft via Gamma Sutra, we are wholly dedicated to supporting the live game and made the decision to stop steep development on the Nintendo Switch platform to focus on bringing new live content and challenges to steep players instead. Clearly not supporting it if you've cancelled the Switch version. We have more exciting news to share soon. Oh yeah, we're going to be taking the servers down as well. Steep launched in December 2016 and has seen a number of updates over the t over time that added new content. While the big expansion Road to the Olympics was released in December, December 2017, the game exceeded Ubisoft's sales expectations. And then the game was traded in not too long afterwards because you still don't understand the word difficulty. <clears throat> Though the company never said it was what it was projecting the game to sell or how many copies it's moved to date. <laughs> Details Ubisoft. The Switch version of Steep was announced in January 2017, at which time Ubisoft also confirmed the, that the Alaska DLC would come to Nintendo's hybrid console. That's all thrown out the window now as the game has been scrapped for Switch. The Steep page on Nintendo's website has been taken down as well. The game is only available on Xbox One, PS4, and PC. And is no longer coming to the Nintendo Switch.
Now, I've got a couple, now, I've got a few articles here from a couple of good friends, one of them being James Rank, uh, the, uh, the chief operator of uh, Disabled Gaming Reviews, link to his blog will be in the description below. He sent me two articles on Fallout 76. And he, he was actually the one that sent me the article on uh, Spiral, by the way, as well, so kudos to him. <clears throat> and I've also got some articles from John Douglas, big shout out to you as well. He sent me these articles on Fallout 76. The beta will be the full game and you can keep your progress. So, thank you Bethesda. Bethesda has revealed that the upcoming Fallout 76 beta will include the full game and all player progress will be carried over to the November release. This news was addressed on, Fallout, on the Fallout 76 beta FAQ page where the last question reads, is the beta going to be the full game and will my progress carry over to launch? Bethesda simply answered, our current plan for the beta is it will be the full game and, your, and all your progress is saved for launch. We hope you join us. This is how you treat your customers, people. This is how you treat your customers. This is great news for any players who get their hands on the early access codes because it means they won't have to start from scratch after the November release. But how exactly do you get these codes? Their FAQ page has been a great source for information ever since the reveal of Fallout 76 and it pretty much tells you everything you need to know about getting the game early. It says pre-ordering Fallout 76 is the only way to get access to the beta. Fair play. If you pre-ordered through a retailer, you'll need to head to Bethesda.net, create an account, and redeem your code. This will be on your pre-order receipt or email confirmation. Once that's done, near the time of the beta launch, you'll be emailed an access code or download instructions, and away you go! <clears throat> Bethesda recommends when creating your account, you should sign up with the same email which is associated with your Xbox slash PS4 gamertag for easier access and updates. If you pre-order through a digital platform store, Xbox One store, PlayStation store, Bethesda.net, or PC, then you'll automatically receive access on the payment account. So don't worry about redeeming the code. As you can see, PC players won't be able to download the beta from Steam, but only through Bethesda.net. This is also the case when the full game is released, but like Fallout Shelter, it could come to Steam at a later date. The beta will start sometime in October, so you've not got long until you jump into the biggest Fallout world yet. The game is set to be an online survival RPG and unlike any other previous Fallout title, so, so don't be surprised if it becomes a contender for game of the year. Fallout 76 is set to be released on Xbox One, PS4 and PC on November 14th this year. Will you be playing it? What about the Break It Early test application? Let us know. Well, I know I'll definitely be playing it because I've completed Fallout 3 and 4. Not 100%, but I've completed the stories. So here we go. <clears throat> Fallout 76 and Fortnite paved the path for ditching Steam. Oh, Lord Gaben, what have you done? What have you done? <clears throat> Bethesda currently... Bethesda recently revealed via updated beta notes that its upcoming Fallout 76, upcoming game Fallout 76, won't be released on Steam. Both the game itself and the PC beta will only be available via the company's own launcher on Bethesda.net. While it'd be surprising to see a game from any popular series jump from Valve's ship, it's a particularly big deal for Bethesda given the number of incredibly popular games from the developer that have been on Steam: Fallout 3, Fallout 4, Skyrim. Skyrim. Jumping Jiminy's Skyrim! <clears throat> Fallout 76 would, eventually, would effectively be the first major game from the company not to debut on Valve's platform. You know, which, you know which game is also super popular and not available on Steam? I'll give you a hint. About half the world plays it and you can also floss in it to your heart's content. I'm not saying Fortnite was responsible for Bethesda taking the leak away from Steam. Bethesda is far too entrenched in the industry to take its cues from Epic. But I do think Fortnite provides a good case study for anyone considering making the leak away from Valve's platform. It shows you don't have to be distributed via the most 
ubiquitous channels in order to own the world. Also, the root cause of the breakup between both companies might be the same money. Epic Games CEO Tim Sweeney has been blunt in his opinion that Valve's 30% cut of revenue is too high. He had similar harsh words about Google Play's identical cut when it was revealed the Android release would not be coming to the Play Store. 30% of revenue for day one releases, pre-orders, and week one sales? That's tanking a massive hit. And it was a justifiable loss, given that the company was trading it for visibility and the ease of use for gamers. And you might say Bethesda is a big company, so it can afford to take the loss. That may be true, but my point is, the likes of Fortnite are proving that might... that. But my point is, the likes of Fortnite are proving that they might not have to anymore. Six or seven years ago, this would have seemed like an almost unthinkable move. But Bethesda now has multiple other examples of major publish me of major publishers pulling their escape valve. <laughs> escape valve. <laughs> EA created Origin in 2011, and it is poison, and has steadfastly stuck by it ever since. Bungie and Activision also made the break from Steam with Destiny 2, repeating the action with Call of Duty Black Ops 4. Microsoft has stopped offering some of its major games such as Gears of War 4 on Steam in favour of offering it on the Windows storefronts. Fair play. And there's always one built-in parachute. If at first you go it alone, release it on Steam later. Bethesda did this twice with Fallout Fed, Shelter and Quake Champions, releasing both first on their own launcher then later on Steam. As publishers perfect their own launch platform, it's likely they'll debut their titles there first instead of Steam. With so many successful games to use as examples, it's becoming harder to justify releasing it on Steam first. Or how about this? How about not releasing them on Steam at all if you're so concerned about the 30% cut? And releasing them on your own launcher? And that's it! Boom! Steam takes a hit, and they've only got themselves to blame for taking too high a cut, you greedy so-and-sos. <clears throat> Speaking of Steam, segue! Discord set... Discord sets sites on Steam, adds free games, and launches an online store. In brackets, exclusive. And this was just yesterday, in fact. So I believe, apart from other major gaming channels, I'm the first of the small channels to be reporting on this. Discord, the online chat and video service used by 150 million gamers, drops into video games into the video game sales business. Thursday on Thursday with the launch of a beta program that includes both free games for paid membership and more traditional and a more traditional digital retail store. The company is also adding a new universal game launching tab which can launch any game on a user's computer from Discord without having to search for the game on or its own launching program. The move into game sales is designed to extend the reach of the service and find another avenue of revenue. We've actually been mulling the idea for a long time. Discord Chief Marketing Officer Eros Resmini told Variety via, via email. We wanted to build an amazing platform that people wanted to use every day and we wanted to grow that platform before focusing too much on monetization. Now we have 150 million users, so timing felt right. We knew we didn't want to sell our ads or use data, or user data, so we had two options left, cosmetic or content. Nitro was our attempt at cosmetics, now we're adding games to that subscription and building a retail store too. The beta for game sales rolls out in Canada on Thursday, well, today, well, yesterday in fact, to 50,000 randomly selected customers. Those selected will see an upgraded version of Discord Nitro that has access to a curated selection of games along with the current subscription perks. 
They'll also see a new tab in the home screen, the Discord store with individual games for purchase. Initially, only Windows PC users will be supported by the program. Discord hasn't yet determined how long the beta test will run in Canada, but Resmini said the plan is to slowly roll out this new storefront out over time and make decisions based on user feedback. The plans to extend outside Canada are similar. We hope to slowly expand the beta to test different markets, currencies pr prior to launch later this year, he said. The retail store will be curated, a curated selection of titles that will also eventually include first on Discord titles. These are indie games that Discord says it has helped bring to life. They will usually remain as Discord exclusives for the first 90 days and then can be sold anywhere, according to the company. The beta launch lineup of titles doesn't include any first on Discord titles starting Thursday. Nitro subscribers will have free access to 10 titles, Saints Row the Third, Metro Last Light Redux, Darksiders War Mastered Edition, Deblob, Tormentor X, Punisher, Dandara, Kathy Rain, Gonna, Kingdom New Lands, System Shock Enhanced Edition, and Super Meat Boy! <clears throat> the retail store will initially sell the following game Dead Cell, Frostpunk, Omen Sight, Into the Breach, Spellforce 3, The Banner Saga 3, Pillars of Eternity 2, Deadfire, Hollow Knight, Moonlighter, This is the Police 2, and Starbound. Whereas many said games will be selected by a curation team powered by more than 100 people who work at Discord. We generally focus on newer titles for the retail store and games you may have missed on for the Nitro subscription, he said. Discord will also be rolling out a system for developers to submit their games for consideration in the stores, he added. The company takes 30% of sales from games that end up in the store, matching what Valve's massive online game store Steam takes from developers. That's likely not a coincidence. Res Mini said that Discord is absolutely to take on major. Di Why do they not proofread it? Res Mini said that Discord is absolutely taking on major digital stores like Steam. Let me put it this way, he added. If we could build a fraction of what Steam has built, we would be very proud. And I'm only halfway through the article. In April of 2016, Steam reported that it had 125 million users. HA! Discord has more Steam! Take that, Gabe Newell! Compared to Discord's 150 million as of Thursday. And more than 18,000 games for sale. In 2017, 7,600 games were released on Steam. And total sales were an estimated $4.3 billion, according to Steam Spy. Steam recently announced plans to extend, expand into China, teaming up with Tencent for that store. Steam also recently rolled out a Discord-like chat service. While both services seem to be meeting in some middle ground, with Steam coming from si the side of sales and Discord from the side of chat, Discord service is growing to an growing at an incredibly high, high rate. In May 2017, the service had just 45 million users, more than tripling that number in about a year. In May, Discord reported it had 19, mil 19 million daily users. Steam recently reported that it had 43 million daily active users in April. Just last month, analyst group Superdata noted that Discord could become a threat to Steam if it entered the game sales business. I hope it does. That way Steam have to do Half-Life 3. Previously, Steam was invaluable not only because of its storefront, but because it facilitated social connections between players. Superdata research manager Co Carter Rogers told Variety at the time. In 2011, Electronic Arts got flack after breaking away from Steam to form its own storefront. Origin at the time, players feared a slippery slope of multiple companies leaving Steam, resulting in the need to maintain friends lists across a wide range of platforms. Now Discord is where gamers' main friends lists live, not Steam. Even with the launch of the store, Discord Steam is very aware of the importance of its chat service and becoming a one-stop shop for game. Thursday's edition of a Universal Library tab Universal Library tab on the Discord home screen is a big sign of that. If users elect to if users elect to, Discord can scan their computer for games and then make it possible to launch them launch any of them through Discord even if they require another launch. To do that, Discord would simply boot the other launcher and game. 
easy as one, two, three. And in announcing the new services, Discord was quick to stress that, that chat remains a top priority for the company. Video text and video chats remain a primary focus for the company. It says that means staying focused on maintaining a quality user experience and app performance and continuing to build out new features and making sure non-chat services like the store don't get in the way of chatting with friends. The store design is meant to stay in the background until you want it. This also means a focus on chat performance, using things like code splitting and dynamic loading to keep the service from becoming bloated or slow because of new features. It's a reminder that the team behind Discord initially developed an iPad mobile game six years ago and then, listening to their audience and weighing their, their own judgement of what they created, decided to break off the communication tech from the game and invest fully in that instead. Now, six years later, Discord has a 150 million registered users and remains, it says, community and communication focused. And that, Res Mini told Variety, is what will separate Discord from all other online game storefronts. Discord has become a home for many gamers who can use it to connect with friends multiple times a day. Some people seem to live on Discord, he said, with now 150 million registered users. That's a lot of building friendships we're talking about and playing games together. That's how we think we'll fit in differently than other stores out there. Ours will be driven mostly by friendships and playing together. Who better to help you find a game than your friends? A very interesting development there. Right. I'm stopping the music for a moment because we have some sad news for those that like to get their ROMs. Not only do we have an article, we have a statement from the website itself. Law th lawsuit threat shuts down ROM downloads on major emulation sites. Move highlights, Move highlights the lack of legal access options for much of gaming's history. In the wake of Nintendo's recent lawsuits against other ROM distribution sites, major ROM res resp repository, repository, ENU Paradise has announced it will be preemptively cease providing downloadable versions of copyrighted classic games. While ENU Paradise doesn't seem to have been hit by any lawsuits, site founder Mass J writes in an announcing post that it's not worth it for us to risk potentially disastrous consequences. I cannot in good conscience risk the futures of our team members who have contributed to the site through the years. We run EMU Paradise for the love of retro games and for you to be able to revisit those good times. And that's why I have Throwback Thursdays. Unfortunately, it's not possible right now to do so, to do so in a way that makes everyone happy and keep us out of trouble. EMU Paradise will continue to operate as a repository for legal downloads of console, classic console emulators, as well as a database of information on thousands of classic games, but you won't be able to get your games from here for now, as Mass J writes. Since founding EMU Paradise in 2000, Mass J says EMU Paradise faced threatening letters, server shutdowns, and numerous DMCA takedown requests for individual games. Through it all, he says he was encouraged by thousands of emails from people telling us how happy they've been to rediscover and even share their childhood with the next generation in their next generations in their families. And again, like I say, that's why I've got through about 30s on my channel. I've gone through some of my favorite games from my childhood. The Pac-Man World, Space Invaders, Tarzan, and Chicken Run. Those four games on my on my now defunct channel, Dream Chaser Entertainment, were in my top those four games were in my top ten PlayStation 1 games of all time. <clears throat> those kinds of emails highlight just how hard it can be to get legal access 
to vast swathes, swaths of video game history in a convenient downloadable form. Efforts like Nintendo's now defunct virtual console. What the? The virtual console's now defunct? Wow. That's news to me. And periodic re-release collections fill in some of those gaps, often for the most popular games. Still, the game industry doesn't have anything close to the equivalent of Spotify's deep collection of easily streamable music or the tens of thousands of downloadable movies and TV shows available on iTunes and its ilk, like things like Netflix and Amazon Prime. For the vast majority of early gaming history, downloading a ROM from a site like EMU Paradise is often the only feasible method of accessing the game at all. Short of tracking down an original cartridge and hardware, hardware, as Video Game History Foundation founder Frank Cifaldi put it in a 2016 GDC talk, we demonized emulation and devalued our heritage. Now we've relegated a majority of our past to piracy. While legal threats can have a chilling effect on individual ROM sites, stopping, an il stopping the illicit distribution of classic gaming ROMs wholesale is likely an unwinnable game of internet whack-a-mole. As it stands, archive.org still hosts thousands of ROMs on consoles ranging from the Atari 2600 to the original PlayStation. Part of the site's effort to encourage commentary, education, enjoyment, and memory for the history they are part of, as collection manager Jason Scott puts it. Until the industry can come together to provide a convenient legal access to these emulated games, illicit ROM distribution will continue to represent the main access for that history to a large portion of the general public. It's high time for classic gaming's gatekeepers to sort out the rights issues and loosen their grip on these legacy libraries in order to offer a viable alternative to piracy's de facto monopoly on much of gaming history. And this is the statement on the website. As many of you are aware, that the situation with regards to emulation sites has been changing recently. What you probably don't know is that we at EMU, EMU Paradise have been dealing with similar issues for all 18 years of our existence. From receiving threatening letters in the early days to our host suddenly shutting down our servers due to complaints, we've seen it all. We've always, compli we've always complied with takedown requests, but as you can see, there is no guarantee of anything. I started EMU Paradise 18 years ago because I never got to play many of these amazing retro games while growing up in India, and I wanted other people to be able to experience them. Over the years, many folks have joined in and contributed to this vision. I think I can say that we've been successful in spreading our passion for retro games far and wide. Through the years, I've worked tirelessly with the rest of the EMU Paradise team to ensure that everyone could get their fix of retro gaming. We've received thousands of emails from people telling us how happy they've been to rediscover and even share their childhood with the next generations in their families. We've had emails from soldiers at war saying that the only way to get through their days was to be lost in the retro games that they played when they were children. We've got emails from brothers who have lost their siblings to cancel, cancer and were able to find solace in playing the games they once did as children. There are countless stories like these. It's been a long and beautiful journey with many ups and downs. When I started the MU Paradise, things could have gone either way. But right now, the direction they are going in could not be more clear. So where does that leave us? It's not worth it for us to risk potentially disastrous consequences, and I cannot in good conscience risk the futures of our team members who have contributed to the site through the years. We run EMU Paradise for the love of retro games and for you to be able to revisit those good times. Unfortunately, it's not possible right now to do so in a way that makes everyone happy and keeps us out of trouble. This is an extremely emotional decision for me after running this site for so many years but I believe it is the right thing for us at this point of time. Thus, we have decided to make a new start. We will continue to be passionate retro gamers and will keep doing cool stuff around retro games. 
but you won't be able to get your games from here for now. Where we go with this is up to us and up to you. We'll still have our emulated database, the community and everything that's come along with that. We have already made several plans of what is going to happen next. It's going to be a fun new beginning and there's going to be lots to come. We'd also love to hear from you in the comments about what you think we should do. But for now, we need to make this change. We've served the community for 18 glorious years and it's been a hell of a ride. But every end is a new beginning. And we're excited to find a way forward to continue being your number one emulation destination. <laughs> Very clever. Thank you for supporting us through this journey. We could not have done so much without you visiting us, telling your friends about us, uploading screenshots and descriptions, telling us when something was wrong, letting us know when we messed up and more. Thank you for being a part of our community and encouraging us through all these years. How often do you get things like that? Now, let's get back to business. Germany lifts ban on swastikas in video games. Oh. Games will now be given the same consideration as movies when determining allowable content. Interesting. Let's have a look. The swastika is one of the most infamous symbols in human history. The emblem of the Third Reich, the murderous Nazi regime that raised Europe and sparked the deaths of 60 million people in the mid 20th century. Because of that horrific history, it is, its use is largely prohibited in Germany. The specifics are complex, but the upshot is that video games even those that are about or set in the war are forbidden from displaying the symbol at all, even when it's quite clearly being used to depict the gap bad guys. The German version of Wolfenstein to the New Colossus, in, for instance, features no swastikas or other Nazi imagery, makes no reference to Hitler as the Führer, and even does away with his notorious moustache. But that situation is about to change, as Germany's game rating agency USK announced today Google Translation, that video games will now be given the same consideration as movies with regards to allowable content, which means that, as works of art, they are exempt from the ban. That doesn't necessarily mean all swastikas all the time, but a hard no will no longer be the default. Through the change in the interpretation of the law, games that critically look at current affairs can for the first time be given a USK age rating, 
US key managing director Elizabeth Secker told CTV, this has long been the case for films with regards to the freedom of the arts. This is now rightly also the case with computer and video games. The German Games Industry Association issued a statement welcoming the change, saying that it has long campaigned for, for games to finally be permitted to play an equal role in social discourse without exception. The computers and video games have been recognised as cult a cultural medium for many years now, and this latest decision consistently cements that recognition in terms of the use of unconstitutional symbols as well. Managing Director Felix Falk said, We in the games industry are concerned about the tendencies we see towards racism, anti-Semitism, Semitism, and discrimination. We are strongly committed to an open, inclusive society to the values laid out in the German constitution and to Germany's historical responsibility. Many games produced by creative, dedicated developers address sensitive topics such as the Nazi era in Germany, and they do so in a responsible way that encourages reflection and critical thinking. The interactive nature of games makes them uniquely qualified to spark contemplation and debate, and they reach younger generations like no other medium can. The association explained that the USK will now examine games on a case-by-case -case basis to see whether Germany's social adequacy clause, which allows the use of symbols belonging to unconstitutional organizations, the Nazis, as long as they serve an artistic or scientific purpose or depict current or historical events. That law hasn't changed, but its interpretation by the Supreme Youth Protection Authority of the Federal States, or Obresti Landeshugendbehörde, I have no idea how to pronounce that, as locals call it, has and now places games on equal footing with other forms of media. It's interesting and laudable that the German game industry sees the inclusion of swastikas not just as a, not just a sop to historical accuracy, but relevant to current day struggle against racism, anti-Semitism, and author authoritarianism. Video games are currently relevant in contemporary society as are as relevant culturally in contemporary society as movies and books, and they have a role to play in hopefully ensuring that humanity doesn't repeat history's horrific mistakes, particularly as folk note folk noted for younger generations. To celebrate the updated interpretation of Germany's swastika law. And we're not even going to go into that. Fortnite shunning the Android Play Store is a major security headache. Interesting. And this was just earlier today, in fact. Epic has released Fortnite Battle Royale on select Samsung devices. The rest of Android should get it in a few days, but with a twist. Both gamers and Google should be very worried. Epic Games has finally dropped its bombshell. Nearly five months after it launched on the Apple App Store, the uber popular game Fortnite Battle Royale is finally available on Android, albeit with a catch. For the first few days, the only Android devices with, on which Fortnite will be available are made by Samsung. Mm -hmm. Gamers, however, won't necessarily have to buy the brand new Samsung Galaxy no. Note 9 or Tab S4, distributed through Samsung's Galaxy App Store. Millions or millions of older Samsung devices, all the way back to the Samsung Galaxy S7, S7 Edge, and of course the newer S9 and S9 Plus, Note 8, S Gal Galaxy S8, and S8 Plus. The Tab S3 will all will be able to, and Tab S3 will be able to run Fortnite. It's the icing on Fortnite's multi-platform offering after the game came out early on PlayStation 4, Xbox One, Nintendo Switch, and PCs and Macs. If you don't have a Samsung, don't bother tapping your Google Play Store to find Fortnite. Once Samsung's exclusivity period is over, reportedly lasting just a few days, 
you will have to go to Epic and download the firm's own game launcher app. As Epic CEO Tim Sweeney announced on August 3rd, the company is bypassing the Google Play Store, and that's where the problems begin. Fortnite fans have been asked to disable default security settings for their Android devices and download the game from a dedicated Fort from a dedicated Fortnite app. What does it mean? Not just for Epic and the security of gamers, but more fundamentally for Google's business model for Android. Google Play is very important for Android's business model and even more so now following the huge fine the EU recently imposed on Google for forcing manufacturers to install its other apps, says Daniel Gleason, an analyst at Ovum. Last year, the total value of app revenue flowing through Google Play was $38.4 billion, and adds Gleason, Ovum forecasts it will rise to $47.6 billion this year, given Google's 30% cut on any payment and company the company is expected to earn more than 14 billion dollars from google play in 2018 alone games revenues make up over two-thirds of all google play income it took epic ages to release fortnite on android and this may be a clue in itself chances are that the company took its time to decide whether it should challenge google on and the mobile platform model by distributing the game outside Google Play, Epic will not have to pay Google's 30% tax for the game developers. This translates into instant profits. The move, however, undermines the fundamental platform approach pursued by Google and its old frenemy, Apple. Both iOS and Android offer developers access to a huge ecosystem of users into tied into the functionality of their respective platforms. In return, Apple and Google can extract a hefty chunk of cash from all developers tapping into this ecosystem. Apple gets 30% of all revenues flowing through its App Store. Google Play gets the sh same revenue share, although many games that cost money on iOS are free on Android. This platform tax is a heavy burden on developers, but they have to grin and bear it as they need access to users. There's one key difference though. Apple has its platform completely locked down. Android on the other hand offers a bit more flexibility buried deep in its settings. It offers the option to disable a fundamental security setting and make it possible to install applications from third party websites or app stores. That makes Android a less controlling platform than iOS. But Epic's distribution strategy means that Android's greater flexibility has come, to bite, come back to bite Google. It's easy to see why Epic doesn't want to share the spoils of its epically successful shooter game. It offers Fortnite for free, but makes players pay for new skins, characters, and other in-game perks, which in July helps the game pass the $1 billion revenue threshold. And I am not going to go through all of that. That is a long... I am not going through all of that. Because I'm already an hour deep. So, next up, we've got news on Sonic the Hedgehog. So there we go. Jim Carrey confirms he will play Dr. Robotnik in the live-action Sonic movie. I grew up with Dr. Eggman. Rumours have been circulating for some time about the upcoming Sonic the Hedgehog film, since Paramount announced it will be bringing everyone's favourite hedgehog to the big screen. Wow. There's been a particular speculation about whether the film will be CGI and who will play the iconic lead character. Doubtless to the relief of many fans, Jim Carrey, who was rumoured to be playing by Dr. Ivo Eggman Robotnik, has confirmed that he is indeed involved in the project and will be bringing his comedic talent to the role of the villainous mad scientist. Speaking at, television, at the Television Critics Association press tour about his latest projects, Kerry revealed the film is live action but didn't give away many other details. When asked how he plans on bringing the Eggman to life, Kerry replied, Magic mixed with desperation. What else do we know? 
While we don't have many details about the upcoming film, we do know Kerry will star alongside Westworld's James Marsden, ride along Tika Sumter, and the characters Natasha Rothwell. Marsden plays a police officer in the town of Green Hill. Haha, <laughs> Green Hill's up. <laughs> who teams up with a young delinquent Sonic the Hedgehog in an effort to stop the maniacal Dr. Robotnik from taking over the world. We currently don't know which roles Sumter and Rothwell have been cast in, or who will play Sonic himself. Sonic the Hedgehog is currently in production and is expected to release on November 15th, 2019. November 15th next year, we finally have a release date for Sonic. Yes! Right, next, an article from the BBC News. IGN sacks writer amid YouTuber plagiarism controversy. Prominent gaming news website IGN has apologised and sacked a writer who was alleged to have plagiarised a game review. The company, the company was criticised after YouTuber Boomstick Gaming found similarities between his review of Motion Twin's multi-platform title Dead Cells and IGN's review of the same game. Although the IGN review has since been removed, it can temporarily still be accessed via Google's web cache service. In response, IGN have removed the review from their website, apologised to Boomstick and parted ways with the reviewer. We take our review process seriously, we did read an official statement. We apologize to our readers, developer Motion Twin, and most specifically, the YouTuber known under Boomstick Gaming. After taking time to investigate, we determined there were substantial similarities between a review posted weeks earlier and our review that could not be justified. The review itself was simply not acceptable. We parted ways with the writer involved. Speaking to the BBC, Alex Kay, the man behind the Boomstick Gaming YouTube channel, explained his ideal outcome did not include the IGN writer losing his job. As for the writer, Alex Kay said, this was his first video review for IGN. It is slightly understandable to seek knowledge from someone who has done multiple reviews before, but it should not have been replicated in this manner. I foster no ill will towards him and do not encourage the firing of this gentleman. I have been unemployed for six months now and would not wish this burden on anyone. I do not know much about the writer, but hopefully he finds a career soon. And he confirmed that he has been contacted by IGN editorial manager of games Tina Amini, who offered her apologies to him and said she understood the efforts made by passionate people like him in their work. Alex K identifies 10 similarities between the two reviews in a video posted to his Boomstick Gaming YouTube channel. Among his complaints, he claims both videos follow a similar structure and refers to several incidents of phrases and sentences he says were lifted almost word for word. For example, in part of his review, Boomstick calls the combat system in Dead Cells fast, fluid, responsive, and one of the most rewarding representations of 2D combat in the, of the entire genre. While in their review, IGN said fights are fast, fluid, responsive, and hands down one of the most gratifying representations of video game combat I've ever experienced. Yeah, that's a bit of an issue. How common is this? YouTube has had a long, complex relationship with copyright. Its controversial content ID system has proven to be effective, although not perfect. It's never been perfect, and it probably never will be at identifying when someone has used unlicensed music or footage. 
it cannot do, but it cannot do anything about the alleged plagiarism in this case, where the footage and audio is different. But both videos may appear to follow a similar script. Nonetheless, there are countless YouTube videos of people making such allegations today, with popular YouTubers often accused of adapting content from smaller channels. And with this type of plagiarism so difficult to spot, Jason Shirai, news editor of game website Kotaku, called for people online to refrain from being critical of IGN. Before you attack IGN for this, please do remember that nobody else at IGN could have possibly known that this has happened, and that, the, and that a whole lot of good people at IGN were also harmed by this writer's actions. There are, there is others, there is another side to this controversy, how it affects Motion Twin, who developed the game, which lost its 9.7 review from IGN overnight. In a statement to the BBC, Motion Twin called the situation quite uncomfortable. The public shaming and witch hunting that occurred on social media seems unnecessary and downright immature given the circumstances, read the statement. From this perspective, it was refreshing to see the way that Boomstick, the real injured party, handled himself, always remaining civil and strikingly human. In any case, we can have a more constructive public discussion than what we've been seeing so far. Some have asked about how we feel about losing the review. The rest have been stellar, and IGN will do another. In any case, the internet drama will have more than made up for any lost visibility. It's just a shame that it had to come at such a cost and contribute to more online negativity. Right. Next up. We have got the gameplay video for Red Dead Redemption 2. I'm only going to have the audio in the background, folks, to prevent any more copyright issues coming. I've had more than enough copyright issues over the course of the last week. I don't need any more. <laughs> They'll probably hang you, buddy. <laughs> oh, that's pleasant. Pleasant to know. In the late 1800s, America was evolving, on its way to becoming the most powerful country in the world. New immigrants arrived, thriving outposts became towns, and civilization was spreading rapidly into the huge, wild, and lawless frontier. With Red Dead Redemption 2, Rockstar Games aims to create a living world that's not simply open, but deeper. Come on, pretty boy. More interactive and detailed than ever. <laughs> Combining action. Ah. Hand to hand combat. Storytelling. We need to get those people more than fair. And gameplay in new ways. As you live, ride, and fight to survive. Dead eyes back. As an outlaw in a notorious gang. As long as we get paid or you get shot, I'm happy. <laughs> Rockstar Games presents. Redemption 2. Gameplay and Introduction Part 1. The game is an attempt to capture this pivotal moment when the Age of Outlaws was ending and the ah. modern world was born. There is a huge world to explore, set across a range of ah. America's heartland and frontier. From harsh mountain trails and dense forests to untamed swamplands and sweeping deserts, rugged livestock towns to modernizing cities and much more. All populated with a diverse cast of characters from turn of the century life. Now shoo, please. I'm waiting for someone interesting to turn up. Ooh, shots fired. You play as Arthur Morgan, a trusted senior gun in the Vanderling Gang. Arthur Morgan. A band of outlaws and outcasts on the run from the pressures of civilized life. We are gonna borrow a little money from old Uncle Sam and be out of his hair once and for all. Each time they're forced to flee an area, the gang sets up a camp as a base. This is where gang members eat, sleep, perform chores, play games, and share stories. Anyway, I got caught by some hill country sheriff stealing a chicken, I think it was, and he decided I was going to be hanged for it. These are the people Arthur calls family, and you will get to know each gang member over the course of the game. Excellent. So, 
You save the silly bastard's life, then you and him go robbing sheep. Helping the camp with food and supplies will keep morale high, while spending time with other gang members can reveal new secrets, fun things to do, and opportunities for mischief. How about you and me go and redistribute some property? In and out of camp, the world is alive and responds to the player. Well, ain't this a rare tree? And your guns aren't the only way to interact with the environment. Call out to a passing rider. That's a nice horse. Talk yourself into trouble with a local tough guy. Clear out. Or out of trouble with a town sheriff. Or intimidate a witness into silence. And more. Keep your mouth shut. You're dead, friend. You don't want to involve yourself with this. Confrontations can be escalated or diffused. Take it easy. Do what you want. I don't care. You can form friendships. God. You did it. Or make enemies as you choose. You killed my cousin, you sick son of a bitch! Your actions have consequences, Apologies for the and it's up to folks. you to decide just how honorable game. Arthur is. Should I have killed you, Jimmy Brooks? Me? Shooting and fighting have both been radically improved to make combat deep and engaging at all times. Each weapon has unique characteristics with realistic reload and recoil that always keeps the player grounded and connected to the action in a gunfight. In a similar way, the bond with your horse is crucial and changes based on your treatment of the animal. Hold still, girl. Some breeds are better suited for certain tasks. I got a fella been looking for a decent workhorse like this for a while. Your saddle and saddlebags can store extra weapons along with supplies and animal carcasses that you pick up while out roaming or hunting. Over time, the bond between you and your horse will grow, making them easier to control in <laughs> tense situations. There's a bit in the top right yeah, that says, What a the devil got him. Dead or alive. A rich and varied ecosystem thrives in the world, full of predators, prey, and scavengers, all smart and sometimes deadly. You want to come with me? I'll show you how we hunt one. Hunting helps the camp or earns you money. Wound an animal and you'll have to track them down. Animal pelts and other items you find can be traded for cash to use at general stores, gunsmiths, saloons, and elsewhere. This is God's own country, and I feel I'm in purgatory. This is a world that is rich in depth and detail. You can definitely see All designed that. to be explored on horseback or on foot. As you live the fateful journey of a gang of outlaws on the run across America. In the next gameplay video, we'll look at missions, activities, enemy gangs, robberies, other things to do, and much more, including the evolution of sharpshooting using the Deadeye system. So we're gonna go into more detail with the Deadeye system, yes! October 26th! This video was captured entirely from in-game footage, and my word, it looks gloriously beautiful! It looks so gloriously beautiful. Now. Next up, Shadow of the Tomb Raider. Separate difficulty settings for combat, exploration, and puzzles. Lara Croft can do it all. She can lethally dispose of enemies, explore uncharted territories, and solve many mind-bending puzzles. Because for some reason, ancient civilizations were apparently in competition to see who could come up with the most complex way to open a door. <laughs> but if you'd like your experience to be a little less about combat and a little more about exploration or puzzles, Good news, everyone! Shadow of the Tomb Raider has separate difficulty settings for each category. Excellent! You can see a full breakdown as well as other accessibility options on the official Shadow of the Tomb Raider site. For exploration, easy mode might highlight... For exploration... For exploration, X Easy Mode highlights important parts with conspicuous environmental cues, while Normal Difficulty blends them into the normal. Into the background a bit more, while Hard Mode features no such clues at all, 
easy mode will give Lara more time to make saving grabs for those extra dramatic leaps. And base camps, where you rest, save and stock up on supplies, are lit. Normal mode gives the default amount of time to make a saving grab, and base camps are unlit. On hard mode, Lara has the shortest amount of time to... Uh, has the shortest amount of time, is also unable to use her survival instincts ability during exploration portions of the game, and are unlit. Puzzles can be more varied. On easy mode, Lara can, will give direct hints on what to do, her survival instinct ability will highlight objects she can interact with and mark objects necessary to progress in blue, and players will have a longer window of opportunity for timed mechanics. Normal mode will have Lara give more general hints, and her survival instincts will highlight interactive objects but not distinguish between what is and isn't required to solve the puzzle. Hard mode won't allow Lara to use survival instincts at all during puzzles, She'll have the shortest window for timed mechanics, and she'll give no clues. I personally love this idea, as do I. I like this. I'm much more interested in the idea of Lara as an explorer, and I enjoy the challenge of solving a centuries-old riddle much more than mowing down Anonymous Thug number 47. Letting players tweak the game so that it suits their individual tastes should result in a more enjoyable experience for everyone. I am now looking forward to this coming out more. Players we want to see in a new Def Jam game. Now, I reported on this last week that there was rumours of potentially a new Def Jam game being in the works. So, here we go. This is what I talked about. Earlier this month, Def Jam Recordings stoked the flames of speculation when it tweeted about the possibility of a new Def Jam game, which I reported on on last week's podcast. The fighting game series pits hip-hop celebrities and musicians against one another as they use the crowd and environment to unleash epic beatdowns against their industry rivals. A new Def Jam game hasn't been released in over a decade, and so many were excited at the thought that it could make a comeback. There are, there are, there are lots of crucial details to be ironed out in regard, regarding a Def Jam Fight for New York sequel. Not only does this include the location and the gameplay features, but it also includes the character roster. Which hip hop, which hip hop heavyweights do we want to see? Right. Well, we've got we've got Nicki Minaj to kick off proceedings. Nicki Minaj is currently on full promotion in full promotion mode. Hold on a second. Uh... Nicki Minaj is currently in full promotion mode as she prepares to go on tour and release Queen, the follow-up al follow album to 2014's The Pink Print. However, given the rapper's headline-making history, many of her fans, affectionately, affectionately known as Barbs, will hope that she can find time to star in a new Death Jam game too. Over the years, Minaj has found herself embroiled in beef with with everyone from Taylor Swift to Remy Ma uh, to Mariah Carey and even reality TV star Farah Abraham of Teen Mum OG. In an interview with talk show host Ellen DeGeneres, Minaj expressed regret over her feuds, that, but that doesn't mean she won't want she won't want to settle a few scores in the virtual Death Jam arena. Cardi B. Cardi B appears to have the rap game in the palm of her hand right now. She's featured on tracks with Bruno Mars, Jennifer Lopez, Maroon 5, and me, and my goss. While she's a chart topper in her own right with singles like Bodak, Yellow, and I Like It, taken from her acclaimed debut album, Invasion of Privacy, during Cardi B's stratospheric rise to the top, she has mostly avoided actual rap beefs, the so-called feud between Cardi and Nicki Minaj was made up by the internet, says the rapper. 
while the beef between herself and Azealia Banks, in which Banks called her a caricature of a black woman, was short-lived. Though she has spoken public, spoken plenty about her haters, and no doubt would like to see her take on said nameless nobodies in a new Death Jam game. Drake! Hot off the heels of his record-breaking album Scorpion, Canadian rapper Drake may not have a huge amount of time on his hands, but fingers crossed that he has just enough time to take part in the development of a new Death Jam game because he will likely be the most asked for rapper to star in the game. Not only is Drake a keen gamer, having taken part in a record-breaking Fortnite stream with Ninja, but he also has... a long history of rap beats. The most well-known is and most recent may be Drake's drama with Pusha T, who not only revealed that Drake has a son, but also made the image of Drake in blackface makeup go viral. Oh, 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 snap! There's also the beef with Nicki Minaj's ex-boyfriend Mick Meek Mill, which spawned several devastating diss tracks, as well as beef with Common, with Common, Ludacris, Jay Z, and Kanye West. While Drake prefers to settle with music than with passive aggressive Instagrams, it would be pretty cool to see October's very own Bring the Fight, the Death Jam franchise. Speaking of Meek Mill, as of 20, May 2018, Meek Mill's high profile beef with Drake has officially been squashed. Meek may have accused Drake of using ghostwriters, but given that Drake backed a high profile campaign calling for the Philadelphia native to be released from prison, it seems that the two men are finally on much better terms now. That doesn't mean that fans would be opposed to seeing Meek Mill and Drake duke it out in a new Def Jam game though. Meek Mill has also had beef with 50 Cent, The Game, Joe Budden, and Safari, and Safari Nicki Minaj's ex-boyfriend and co-collaborator. And these would all make brilliant viewing and gaming in a Def Jam game. Plus, Meek is an avid gamer. Well, hmm. Having once helped to make a mobile game called Meek Mill Presents Bike Life, so he may well be interested in featuring in the Def Jam title too. Kendrick Lamar. Kendrick Lamar is one of the more is Kendrick Lamar is one incredibly talented rapper. Having even won the 2018 Pulitzer Prize for music from his album Damn! That's why when Kendrick publicly called out Drake, Whale, Pusha T, J. Cole, J. Sean, and more during his feature on Big Sean's Control, HOF in 2013, many took him seriously. Since Control, HOF, dropped, Kendrick Lamar has been less shy to call people out. He's continued to poke barbs at Drake, particularly at his use of Ghostwriters and in Humble, a track from Damn. He even seemed to use Big Sean's own catchphrase against him. Ooh. Other people, other people to feel Kendrick's wrath include Donald Trump, ha! Fox News, and all of the rappers who had their feelings hurt after control. Oh, HYF dropped. It's likely that the President of the United States or an entire news organization would be represented in a video game. But plenty would like to see Kendrick face off against those rappers in a Def Jam game at least. And brutalize Donald Trump while we're at it because I would love to do that. Chance the Rapper. Chance the Rapper isn't one to keep in his feelings quiet. The Chicago-based MC has weighed in on everything from Chicago's public school system to Netflix movies, Heineken adverts, and most recently Fortnite's use of dance emotes. Although he isn't especially known for his rap beefs, his beef, his beef with Vic Mensa was more of a vague squabble between two old friends. Chance's outspoken nature makes him the perfect fit for Def Jam, which has always la featured larger-than-life personalities. The biggest obstacle, though, is that Chance himself has criticised Jeff Def Jam recordings in the past. In a parody image from his tour that poked fun at major labels, Def Jam became Don't Join. Oof. Ouch. Hopefully the label doesn't hold grudges and Chance can still make his way onto the roster. Childish Gambino. 
Donald Glover. He was in the Han Solo Star Wars film! Donald Glover, aka Childish Gambino, has been upping his game lately. Not only did he make shockwaves by releasing politically charged anthem, This Is America, but his star turn as Lando Calrissian in Disney's Han Solo origin movie and his hilarious hosting on Saturday Night Live also got people talking. But could the next step be a feature in the new Death Jam game? As a man who has had several beefs on his own, including public callouts of Drake, Kendrick Lamar, Schoolboy Q, even Lady Gaga, Childish Gambino would be well suited for Def Jam. His acting talents would lend themselves well to whatever narrative and cutscenes the Def Jam development team cooks up while his friendship with Chance the Rapper could also make for some thrilling tag team takedowns. Kanye West, I was literally thinking about him being in the game. Few rappers have garnered headlines and controversy like Kanye West. While few would doubt that his musical talent is immense, Through the Wire remains a classic. His beast with everyone from Taylor Swift, but Beyonce had one of the best videos of all time! You... No, oh, I am not even going to finish that. Jay-Z, Justin Timberlake, and Wiz Khalifa that have had people talking just as much. Yay's support for Donald Trump. He supports Donald Trump, heaven forbid. Also divides his fans, making him a contentious but entertaining pick for the Def Jam character roster. Plenty would either love to settle some beefs as Kanye's or settle their own beef with the rapper by taking him on. Big Sean. Oh my word. Didn't he used to date Ariana Grande? I'm pretty sure he used to date Ariana Grande. <laughs> yep, he used to date Ariana Grande. Ooh. As mentioned, Big Sean previously found himself targeted by Kendrick Lamar during the latter's epic verse on Control HOF. Although Sean has said publicly that he had no plans to change his own verse on the song in response, even if Kendrick did diss him, Control HOF didn't make it onto Big Sean's album either. Big Sean's beef with Kendrick has been much, been of much discussion in the five years since, stoked by Kendrick's subliminal shot at rapper. The Heart Part Four also seems to be seems to take aim at his former collaborator. And interviews, however. Despite Big Sean's protest that Kendrick didn't wash him with his control verse, it seems that the two men haven't formally squashed their beef either. The next Def Jam game could be a good opportunity to make that happen, in a fictional universe at least, especially as Big Sean is actually a Def Jam recording artist. Boom, boom, boom! Show me the money! Like I say, Big Sean used to date Ariana Grande as well. Azealia Banks. While certain artists on this list, looking at you, Drake and Nicki Minaj, have had their fair share of feuds, the title of biggest beefer undoubtedly goes to Azealia Banks. It seems that the 212 MC is rarely out of the headlines for her controversial comments against fellow industry names. Just as some of the people Miss Banks has criticized include Cardi B, Nicki Minaj, Remy Ma, Iggy Azalea, Rihanna, Erika Badu, Lil Kim, Rita Ora, Zayn, Ma Zayn Malik, Zayn from One Direction, Beyonce, Pharrell, Kendrick Lamar, Eminem, ASAP Rocky, and T.I., who starred in a previous game, Jeff Jam Icon. Azealia has gotten into it with... has even gotten into... Oh my word! Azealia has even gotten into it with then 14-year-old Disney star, star Skay... Jackson, Azealia could be the catalyst for all kinds of drama in a Def Jam game, and given her history, the narrative would seem totally believable. It's important to note that a new Def Jam game has yet to officially be announced, meaning that this is just as possible that the Def Jam recordings teaser was just that, a teaser and nothing more. Watch this space for official news though, hopefully some of these picks will make the character roster. I would love a Def Jam game. 
with all of this. Here we go. Microsoft brings Pub Player Unknown's Battlegrounds iconic blue camper van to life. Just when you thought the UK had run out of heatwave related spin offs, Microsoft brings Player Unknown's Battlegrounds iconic blue camper van to life. For reasons not entirely obvious, Xbox decided to let loose the camper found in PUBG's Miramar map as a des desert van. As a dessert van. Running until mid September, the PUBG van will be travelling the length of the country from Brighton to Blackpool, handling handing out ice lorries to anyone in need of some relief from the sweltering heat. From Miramar to the Midland, here comes the PUBG van! <laughs> Fans of the series will be more... Fans of the series... It's only had one game! Fans of the game will be more familiar with the camper van, which has been in PUBG since late May. Since the late May updates introduced Miramar, the second playable map in the game. And it has been impeccably recreated for a country-wide tour. Though the, though the player base appears to be in decline on PC, March saw Microsoft proudly announce that over 5 million players have bought PUBG on the Xbox since it was released at the beginning of 2018. Still an Xbox game preview though. Although doubts persist over its long-term place in the Battle Royale genre, developer PUBG Corp are finally making a concerted effort to get the game up to scratch with the Fix PUBG campaign. So why not bring one of the game's most recognisable vehicles to life? Ride the wave of positive ER, PR, and loot some ice lollies! Xbox are keen to point out that the handouts aren't restricted to just ice lollies. Though. Every 100th person to be served at each location will be handed a selection of PUBG freebies. Judging by the posts under the PUBG hashtag, pub, the PUBG van hashtag, those goodies appear to be copies of the game. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. If you do spot the camper van, Xbox UK want you to tag them in your tweets and use PUBG van, use hashtag PUBG van for the chance to win additional prizes such as 12 months Xbox Live codes, copies of the game, and an Xbox One X. Here we go. Last piece of news for today before we get into the points and trophies. Sony celebrates 500 million consoles sold with limited edition trans... Translucent... Translucent... Uh, how have you pronounced that? PS4 Pro. A limited edition PS4 Pro, basically. Sony has unveiled the new limited edition PS4 Pro system in celebration of the massive 500 million systems sold in PlayStation history. The new 500 million limited edition is indeed very limited, with only 50,000 systems planned to be sold around the world, and will be available August 24th. This limited edition PS4 Pro comes in a gorgeous translucent design with an accompanying translucent DualShock 4 controller. Senior Vice President of Marketing at PlayStation Worldwide, Eric Lempel, introduced the eye-catching limited edition in a blog post today on the official PlayStation blog. The occasion for this limited edition is at least as big news as the actual console itself. Sony has managed to sell a staggering 525.3 million PlayStation systems since the original PlayStation entered the home console market in 1994. That's almost a quarter of a century of presence for the PlayStation brand. Next year's 25 years, beggar's belief. Indeed, the first PlayStation became an immediate success with over 100 million systems sold in its life cycle, cementing Sony as a dominating participant in the console race up until today. After stumbling slightly through the seventh generation gen console generation with the PS3, Sony picked up pole position with the PS4, firmly planting itself way ahead of its competitors, the Xbox One, and Nintendo Wii U and Nintendo Switch. It does look really good, I'm not gonna lie, it does look really good!
Just recently, we received, we received confirmation that by Sony that the PS4 was set to overtake the lifetime sales of its predecessor, the PS3. Any moment now, and today, the Japanese tech company is already celebrating another huge milestone. And like the occasion is calling for, Sony knows how to party by releasing a limited edition PS4 Pro. Made with translucent outer casing, the, this 500 million limited edition PS4 Pro is sure to become a prized possession for anyone lucky enough to get their hands on it. With a special copper plate engraved with the system's unique limited edition serial number, the feeling of owning something extraordinarily special only gets heightened. The limited edition console further features a massive 2 terabyte hard drive, includes a PS PlayStation camera. The limited edition bundle will cost $500. Not only the console itself is special, however, as the DualShock 4 is also getting a special treatment. With a translucent design of its own, the 500 limited 500 million limited edition DualShock 4 is going perfectly together with the limited edition console. Thankfully, Sony will be releasing a special this special DualShock 4 separately for $64.99. $65. A limited edition a 500 million limited edition gold wireless headset in the same design was also unveiled and will be available for $100. And there we go. That is the end of news. Now, we have 40 achievements to go through. And that also means 1,000 Gamer Score! And that means only one thing, ladies and gentlemen. Roll the transition. Points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting, points and trophies, trophy achievement hunting. So, here we go. 40 achievements, and I'm going to go through every single one. So, here we go. We happy few. A bit of the old ultra violence. 15 gamer score. Kill 100 NPCs across all playthroughs. A heavy burden. Spread the message. 15 gamer score. Archipelagist. Set foot on every island. 15 gamer score. Arthur Hastings. 15 gamer score. Take Flash as Arthur. Maybe you're a rich man. Gain £1,000 from looting, bartering, looting or bartering across playthroughs. 15 gamer score. Bon voyage! Complete Ollie's intro. 15 gamer score. Breaking Blackberry. 15 gamer score. Complete Sally intro. Cat Burglar. 15 gamer score. In Tom Thomasina House, collect all fake cats. Downer. 15 gamer score. Complete Arthur's intro. Employee of the month. Read all articles as read all fifteen gamer score. Read all newspaper articles as Arthur and redact only the uncomfortable ones. Enjoy the view. Correctly sabot enjoy the view. Correctly sabotage Clive Bert Whistle's redactor work. Fifteen gamer score. Gotta catch em all, gotta catch em all, Pokemon. Wait, wrong game. Catch 40 butterflies with Sally's butterfly net. 15 gamer score. Get the float out of here! 15 gamer score. Complete the Jacobean Club encounter. I got better. Contract and cure the plague. 15 gamer score. I love the smell of chloroform in the morning. <laughs> Knock out 50 NPCs with the atomizer. Another reference to Apocalypse Now. Ah, I love the smell of achievement in the morning. Smells like gamer score. <laughs> Lighten up! Playing as Ollie, use 25 lightning rods, 15 gamer score. 
Miss Bing is indisposed. Complete no place like home encounter. 15 gamer score. Mother of all victories. Complete band of brothers encounter. 15 gamer score. Not in Kansas anymore. And another we're not in Kansas anymore reference. Oh my word. How many times have we heard... <clears throat> How many times have we heard the... Amazing, amazing, oh, what a world, what a world. And we're not in Kansas anymore. How many times have we heard those two lines in popular culture today? 15 gamer score, cross into the village for the first time. Oh, that makes sense. Now I can die happy. Die while overdosing on joy. That's going to be an easy achievement to get. 15 gamer score. Our prudent friend. 15 gamer score. Listen to all the phone calls in the phone boxes. 15 gamer score. Shocking biology. Kill a guy named Ryan Andrews. <gasps> oh my god, Bioshock! <laughs> yes! Bioshock reference! Yes! Would you kindly make a reference to the first Bioshock game? <laughs> For 15 gamer score. That is that is brilliant. Hang on a sec. Right, hang on. Dum dum dum. <laughs> somebody somebody put in the comments. Ah, I see what you did there. Uh-huh. You are welcome. Snug as a bug on a drug. Oh my pleasant. Take the joy at the very beginning of the game. 15 gamer score. Sugar Daddy, inject yourself with glucose 10 times. 15 gamer score. I hope he's not diabetic. That kind of game. Retrieve the credentials from the club. 15 gamer score. The Great Lubricator. 15 gamer score. Deliver the cod liver oil. The importance of not being seen. Finish the mystery house without being spotted once. 15 gamer score. That's, this is going to be fun to 100%. The Slaughterer's, the slaughterer's Apprentice. I'm impressed I managed to do that. Finish all the Butcher's Apprentice quests. 15 Gamer Score. The Toxic X. Complete speaking with Verloc at the Joy Factory. 15 Gamer Score. The Wired. I've got Now I've got a... Well, plus, no, at least I've got a free socket now. Anyway, here we go. Next one. Right. The Wired Sisters complete the Crohn's encounter 15 gamer score. Give me shelter on Lord Call of Arthur's shelters for 30 gamer score. Hot on her heels, find all the notes related to Prudence 30 gamer score. Ar the Arthur Hastings finish Arthur's playthrough for 30 gamer score. The Ollie Starkey complete finish Ollie's playthrough for 30 gamer score. The Sally Boyle finish Sally's playthrough 30 gamer score. Do you do know Jack? Complete all Uncle Jack shows 30 gamer score. Don't you, don't you have somewhere to be? Survive 50 days, 90 gamer score. Re rem remember, remember, find all collectibles, 90 gamer score. The Saint, complete the entire game without directly murdering anyone, 90 gamer score. Have fun with that one. And Resistance is futile. Talk to Johnny Bolton from the secret radio room for 100 gamer score. And there we go. That is it. That is it, ladies and gentlemen. That is the... Whew. Wow. That was all that. That is it. That's it for this week's edition of the Trophy Achievement Podcast. Tomorrow, another two episodes of Tom and Jerry since. In the meantime, hope you enjoyed what you saw. If you did, as always, hit the thumbs up. And if you want to be baptized into following this channel, hit the subscribe button down the bottom, click the bell to join the latter facing his notification squad so you don't miss anything I do on this channel. Uh, I've got my, the, my chicken run playthrough on the left, podcast playlist on the right, Tom and Jerry Sims tomorrow. Until then, enjoy the rest of your day, peace out, stay faithful as well.